So tonight we have three chairs, but we have two visual artists, three musicians, and one poet. So, <laughs> so here's Garth Erasmus, who's a visual artist um, and a musician and an activist and much more. And you, uh, he's um, one of the four main um, actors, as I call it, in this exhibition. And you can see his um, visual works over there on the um, lower tables and, and the works on the wall. And you can also see his sculptures and instruments. And uh, later on, you will also be able to listen to um, him playing those sculptures, probably. And then we have Stefan Schneider. Thank you very much for coming and um, uh, maybe not only moderating, more conducting this conversation with Gas. Um, and Stefan is a visual artist and a musician and like, um, like the three of them interweaving these um, different disciplines that are, um, I would say, not necessarily different disciplines in those um, um, artistic positions that they take take on. And um, we have Peter Thiessen as also um, uh, one of the four main actors of this exhibition. And um, he's, um, yeah, he's a musician, but also working with uh, sounds and texts. And all of that is to be experienced in that exhibition, uh, mainly in the installation over there but also as um, um, parts of the um, event, uh, event program. So thank you for coming and enjoy the talk. Thank you, Katia, for the uh, nice uh, invitation, um, introduction here. And um, after the talk, which will take maybe for about one hour, so we will have a short break and then we will, um, the three of us will play an improvised concert, which will take, we have no idea yet, maybe 10 minutes, maybe four or five hours, we will see what will happen. And I've, um, thank you so much for, for inviting me uh, to, to come here and um, I do not live in, in Hamburg and I came here to this wonderful exhibition place um, this morning at about 11 o'clock and I stayed here for the entire day to have a look at uh, um, all the different artworks and um, my impression of this um, space here is that is more than just a, um, a group exhibition which um, consists of the work besides your work Peter and, and Garth also of the work of Ruth Mai and Nezindano Namise and um, I think three years ago, um, I had the opportunity to see um, the performance piece, um, The House of the Broken Bones, uh, which you did perform in Düsseldorf at the EF FFT Theatre. And um, this was consisted of a large group of musicians, performers, poets, and also the two of you were part of that uh, piece plus a number of other musicians. And as far as I know, this was the first time you had ever met, or not that you ever met, but it was the first time that we were working together in a larger ensemble. And can you tell us about the beginnings of your collaboration? Um, thank you, Stefan. Um, yes, the House of Falling Bones was the beginning of our relationship. Um, the relationship between the Kante group and my group, which is Koi Connection. Um, the, uh, the impetus for that project was basically an artistic reflection and the response to the old colonial history of Germany in the old Southwest Africa, which is now Namibia. Um, and um, this is how um, the Kante group and my group made the connection because Peter had seen or heard about our group and the work that we did and saw that it was directly connected to the kind of um, 
research that we wanted to do in, uh, in Namibia. Um, so, as I say, the impetus for that was this research project uh, looking at the history of uh, old Southwest Africa um, through the lens of the colonial imposition. Um, it was, for me, it was a very, very, very important and sort of a revelatory, shall I say, moment because um, it was, it meant my group, uh, the Koi Connection, had always been fascinated and interested in um, this old, old history that we don't know anything about anymore. And here was an opportunity to now to be directly linked to um, all those um, historical facts. And, um, and, and so for me, it, it, it was a wealth of knowledge that we were exposed to. Knowledge in terms of events, place names, issues about, or even, even um, stories that the local people still remembered and reflected on. And all this was at a time where it was um, the, um, the, 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 the issue of returning, the repatriation of bones was very much a prominent feature of the time, actually. So in the context of that, it was very, very important um, that we do this work, I thought. And so we delved into it um, with all our hearts, I must say. Um, but since that time, so the project happened and the theater piece happened and then it finished. And then of course COVID happened. And now for me, this is almost like um, the ending of that chapter, which began with the House of Falling Bones. And um, for me, what has been happening for me, to me, over the last three, four years is I have had um, an endless amount of inspiration for creating new work, simply coming out of the things that I, just speaking for myself, learned from that um, experience, that trip, um, and that, that period of research. I mean, I'm still, I still, um, I still haven't even begun to, to really, um, to really dig into a lot of those stories that I learned about that time. So for me, it's been a huge inspiration and it carried me on throughout the COVID lockdown period, um, creating uh, new work. In fact, all the work that was, that you see here of mine, was done during the COVID period, right up until now, you know? Gas, can you tell us a little uh, about a, a Koi Connection group? Because you mentioned that group in, and I was not sure if it is a group of musicians, is a group of, of, of artists, of, of researchers, and uh, because you mm. seem to have taken or done a research about the history uh, of colonization, and uh, yeah. is it Divided into members or non-members, and so no, it's just it. it's a it's it's a it's a classic musical group, a trio. Uh, we're three guys: um, Glenn Arinsa and Jethro, and Jethro Lowe and myself. Um, and Jethro is the poet in the group. It's basically um, it's basically a poetry performance group, if I can put it like that. In the context of maybe I should give you a little bit of an idea of, of, of the South African context, because um, it's a long tradition stretching back to the um, apartheid times and the times of struggle. Um, culturally, there was a huge poetry, um, a boom in, 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 in poetry performances by activists that came out of um, the struggle period. And in fact, um, the, 
whenever there were um, political events during those times, it was always accompanied by a cultural program. So, for example, there'd be a, a, a seriously heavy-charged political um, speech-making and an event, but it would always be accompanied by a little bit of music-making, but mostly poetry. So there was this huge um, performance poetry tradition that started under apartheid, and it kind of like never ended, really, you know? Um, so Koi Connection is a direct link to those kind of times. Um, I met Jethro, who's the poet in the group, at one of these kind of occasions, way back in the, in the uh, mid-90s. And um, we, we kind of like, we had a mutual sort of liking for each other's work. And we quickly decided that we wanted to work together um, and we were joined later on by Glenn, and um, this is since the late 90s, and we've been together ever since performing um, and so on, having workshops, uh, because um, a lot of our work has to do with um, revitalizing um, the, 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 the specific cultural aspect of South African life, which has to do with identity politics, and specifically has to do with the people known as the Khoisan, um, which is the indigenous people of South Africa. Um, also, also from Namibia. Also from Namibia, that's right, that's right. That was the, the link, we coming from Germany, doing research in southern Namibia. Right. And you're coming from, from South Africa, like recovering the traces of, of the Khoisan people in, right. uh, in Namibia who are called there the Nama. In the Namas, Namibia. that's right, that's right. Yeah, and so, um, so it's a very special group and it's, it's come out because of very special circumstances in South Africa um, related to what is now known as identity politics. Now, this is a big issue in South Africa, identity. It might not, it might not seem to be the, a very trendy thing anymore because the old apartheid and the struggle time is gone. But for me, this is the final frontier of a new struggle in South Africa related to specifically the Khoisan people and the recognition of the Khoisan people as the legitimate um, indigenous people of South Africa. Um, and the reason for this is that um, these people still need to be given their ultimate rights in terms of land issues and so on and so on. I'm sure we will talk about that again later on. But this is how the group began. So all three of us are um, very much inspired by our Khoisan ancestry. And um, because of our age and our history coming out of the struggle, there's a lot of things that we realize and can see happening in the political environment in South Africa or not happening in, in the political environment in South Africa that we have um, come together in order to make a contribution to create this new um, understanding um, about these issues in South Africa. Because these issues are, to put it quite bluntly, swept under the, under the carpet nowadays in the new political dispensation. Um, these kinds of issues have been almost forgotten about, pushed to the side, swept under the carpet. Um, and yeah, so this is how we actually um, came to be formed out of a, a, a shared um, experience of this sort of alienation um, in the South African context. And, and you started working together while ap apartheid was still going, or? No, this I is post-apartheid. So we formed in 
I would say ran about, around about 1999. Okay. And of course, the uh, 1994 was the, the watershed moment for the end of apartheid. Um, but as you can see, um, the end of apartheid did not mean a new shift to an, uh, or a new understanding of what a particular grouping in the society, uh, their issues, um, because of the because of the, the consequences of apartheid, um, I, I, I think I think it's important to to give people an understanding of what it has meant, what colonialism and apartheid has done and created in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a society like South Africa, because there are consequences. Um, during the apartheid times, um, well, as we know, the apartheid government had a system of racial categorization so that everybody had to be kept apart. Hence, apartheid. Um, everybody was given, um, or in the case, the reason why we are so um, fiery about our identity um, in the apartheid context is because under apartheid, our community was given the name of colored people, or in Afrikaans, clearling mensa. Um, and the word colored or the word clearling has no meaning. Um, it, is, it does not denote a people. It's not, a, it's not even, it's not a tribal name. It's not a, we, one can't even begin to think how um, the apartheid government thought about these things or how these things came about. But the word colored is simply a generic term for a people that they could not easily give a racial name to. Like the, the other uh, communities in South Africa have um, tribal names. So it's easy to denote, to denote you know. Um, but colored was a word that was created. So it does not denote any particular characteristics of a people. It was just simply a, a, a big brand name given to a people that was like problematic to uh, categorize, you know. Now, I was born in the 50s. And even as far back as then, growing up in my family and in my community, there has always been a rejection of this word colored. It's because people understood the origins or, yeah, shall I say the origins of this name and what it means and what it meant um, to fit into a, polit uh, a particular kind of political system. So there's always been a rejection of this word as not meaning anything, you know? Um, but during the apartheid times, we were all always in the struggle and f fighting, um, fighting the um, apartheid government. But these were political fights, you know? These were fights on a big scale. Um, I think it can be it can be safely said that these kinds of issues about naming people are a minor issue at, in those times compared to the bigger political fights that had to happen. So we sacrificed these kinds of battles um, in order to in order to um, you know in order to be part of the big anti-apartheid campaign, and so. The, the struggle carried on until eventually 1994, the historical moment arrived and the uh, apartheid system ended. But what happened was very interesting that the new um, post-apartheid government that came in, which was 
the ANC government, we kind of thought, oh, okay, um, you know, we've been in the struggle a long time. We've all been together in the struggle. We've all made equal sacrifices. You know what I mean? We thought that everybody understood what our community had been going through, what our community had sacrificed. But one of the things that happened post-1994 is that um, this notion of affirmative action as a, as, a, as a new action for a new society, um, um, there was this notion that there first had to be some sort of affirmative action happening in order to get people back to a, a, a level of equality so that we can move forward as a society. Um, and so after more than 20 years, looking back now, we all kind of naively thought, oh, okay, we'll give you a chance, you know? Um, there has to be, we agree, there has to be this affirmative action, but we thought we are part of this affirmative action. We thought that we were part of this vocabulary that was um, created that time, right? We thought we were part of this new hopeful future. Um, but an irony occurred because in order to have affirmative action, you had to actually scratch at and deal with the old racial categories that was created ironically in the apartheid times in order to know what, what affirmative action had to be like, right? Um, so ironically, the racial names that were created under apartheid were kept by the new government in order to deal with this issue of um, equality, or getting people back to a certain kind of level playing field. Um, so, so this was a way of, um, of dealing with a strategy that the post-apartheid government gave to deal with um, their notion of how to deal with affirmative action. So, for, administrat for administrative purposes, the names, the racial categories and names were kept in the post-apartheid um, uh, system right up until today. It is still kept in an administrative way in order to, um, um, uh, in order to deal with this uh, affirmative action that I'm, that I'm talking about. You mentioned the term um, new society. Mm. And have there been any models or um, visions for a new society or different types of models how the new society should look like? Well, the, 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 the vision for the new society was always there. It, 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 it was, it's, it's like symbolized by the era of the, um, the Mandela, let's call it the Mandela era just before the, uh, um, um, uh, just before 1994, that period of um, um, getting ready to, to create this new society, there was this vision of having what was called a non-racial society was the vision for the future, non-racial. And this is why I say it's so ironic that in order to have for them to strategize for a non-racial society, they still had to deal and work with old racial names and terms. Yeah. So I think um, I think I began to to talk about trying to give you an an, an an idea of the consequences of apartheid. So this is one of those consequences. Um, the major consequence for me of having been in a racial system is that you have created a society that is still racialized. You've still, you've still got a society that is still critically 
sensitive to racial differences. Whereas the vision was that there would be a non-racial society where these, these racial names, terms, would be cast aside. But that hasn't happened. Uh, can, can I ask you one question? You, you already talked about um, the land question, for example. And since the name of the, our exhibition is sand, maybe you uh, could explain. Uh, my question would be, can you explain how the sand in Port Elizabeth, what, what it means for you and how it feels? How it looks. Sand as a medium in my work. Well, um, I've been an artist most of my life, you know, and I've, I've dealt with many, many, many mediums. And um, as I say, um, when it came to um, the um, late 90s with the creation of the Koi Connection, that period of my life was characterized by a lot of soul searching. Um, as I say, I've, I had a, a, um, a very um, specific kind of childhood upbringing. Um, and um, what I mean by that is I had been brought up with a lot of folklore, tales, tales about my family, uh, stories, you know. Um, which I thought was quite normal. I just, took it, uh, I just took it for granted that everyone, especially the colored community, grew up the way I grew up, you know? But when I was mature, I discovered that this was not so, that everyone was not uh, equal in this way, you know? I realized that, and it became, uh, it became a powerful symbol for me, uh, a powerful inspiration for me in my work, um, knowing how to or what to deal with in my work, you know, because these were issues that were very, very, very deep, you know. Um, um, and I'm, I'm talking specifically about this issue of living in a post-apartheid new society. I can't stress enough um, how important that is and, and how sad it is that uh, we have never achieved this new society that we wanted to. Um, so when I was mature enough to deal with these questions in my, in my art as an artist, um, I I began to realize that the materials and the mediums that I had inherited as a young artist. Mm -hmm. can, can, you, can you maybe uh, specify that? You, I mentioned Port Elizabeth because that's your hometown. That's your, my hometown, yeah. 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 It's, it's, a, it's on the coast. Yes, uh, uh, and, yes. And, um, Would you like to, to, to explain why you had to leave the place? Um, Port Elizabeth. Well, I just had to leave Port Elizabeth because I was part of a migration, an economic migration that happened when I was in my 20s um, and had to come to the big city of Cape Town. Um, it's as simple as that. Okay. Yeah. And, and you, where did you study? I studied in Grahamstown okay. at Rhodes University. I was a student there. So when I finished there, um, um, that was, I mean, okay, never mind that. Um, there was a huge economic slump in the country. And so there was this migration towards the big cities, you know, and I was just part of that migration. Um, but when I came to Cape Town, I landed up in Cape Town. Uh, when I came to Cape Town for the first time, a lot of the aspects of Cape Town were new to me um, because I had not traveled a lot in my life and it was the first time I had come to the big city. 
But one of the things that I found out about the big city of Cape Town is specifically how the geography and the geology of the place is so closely linked to the political uh, uh, nature of life in South Africa. Um, but it, it, wasn't just, um, it wasn't just an overnight thing. I had to become a mature person to think about this over time, to understand what this means. Now, Cape Town, for those who don't know, is, is unique in that it has a huge mountain called Table Mountain, which, um, if you look at it, you can see it's quite clearly it has come out of the, you know, when, when the earth was formed, this geological shape obviously rose out of the sea, out of the ocean. So you have, in Cape Town, you have this one part of uh, the city being this huge mountain. And then further inland, where the hinterland begins, you have another, um, another mountain range from where the rest of the country begins. So between the mountain of Cape Town and this mountain range on this side, the soil in the middle is the sea sand because Cape Town rose out of the sea. And um, when I was mature enough to think about these things and we begin to realize, whoa, now one of the things that the apartheid government did when they, um, in, in their policy, which was called separate development, they took the land of certain people and they placed these people on this infertile sea sand land, which is called the Cape Flats. It's a huge flat land between the mountain and the mountain range on that side. So this area is called the Cape Flats, and all the people were forced to go and live there. Um, now, I mean, anybody can, can realize that you can't really, I mean, sea sand is not fertile. You know, you can't let anything, you can't get anything to grow, you know? Um, and you can't even, um, If you place people there, if you place communities there, how are communities even expected to grow? This is what I mean. Um, for me, it's a metaphor for the, 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 the political damage that was done by this, uh, the apartheid system. So everybody was forced off the fertile soil next to the mountains onto this infertile soil. And this is where everybody is expected to make a life now. So now, it's, it's, if you think about it, it's quite clear that one of the consequences is going to be serious, serious social problems. Yeah, and, and when you say everybody, I've, I've, I just read the other day that still to this day, I think, 72% of the farmland in South Africa is owned by white people. Yes. To this day. Yes, to this day. Yeah. yeah. Um, so all the fertile, fertile land is, is owned by white people. White still. people, yes. Still to this day. And that is why the land has become such a big issue in South Africa. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, maybe we should mention that to, to the audience that all the sand pictures... Mm -hmm. uh, they are on the on the tables. They are made specifically out of this uh, Cape Flat sand. Yes, it's my chosen medium. Yeah. Um, I was trying to explain how my uh, the medium, uh, my artistic medium, had changed since I was a young man up until um, this particular point, where I could think about things and actually make a conscious choice about how to use materials in a way that makes sense, you know, um, given that I want to deal with my own healing um, 
and, and, and I have had to think about what does healing mean for me as an individual. Um, and I've had to think about that if I am an artist that whose work can communicate on a wider level um, laterally, that it is my duty then to try and um, send this message as far and wide as I can, you know, um, that healing can happen, you know, um, because this is one of the biggest issues also in South Africa is this issue of healing. I know healing as a word can be a cliche in the modern world, right? Um, we're very much aware of all kinds of healing nowadays. But what does it mean to a, a, a polit in, a, in a political society, you know? Um, the, the, the thing is that all of us affected by apartheid, we put all our trust into the, politi the new political system and in the hands of the new politicians. Um, that they would have an understanding of what kind of healing would be necessary for a new society. We thought that that was what would, would happen. And it never happened. Because um, I always like put it like this. Um, when I look at it, when I look at my own family, I have children. I have to live in a community. I see the effects of the uh, of, of um, the apartheid system on in my community. I see it. So the question is simple: what 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 must I do about it? Nobody's going to help me. We've put our faith in the politicians, but. I, 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 how many years is it since 1994? Can anybody tell me? I just can't even think about, I just can't even do any subtraction now. It's close to 30 years, right? It's getting close to 30 years. So in, in 30 years, nothing has happened, you know? And the consequences, the social implications of the consequences of apartheid is just carrying on and getting worse and getting worse. And it is still, being um, characterized by racial terms and by racial means um, to this day, which seems to me like a little bit still like apartheid. It feels still like apartheid, you know? Uh, although, to be fair, you can't really say it's like apartheid, but for me, if you're still um, dealing with things in racial terms, then it still feels like apartheid. You know, so healing for me has to do with issues of the land. Yeah. Okay. Healing for me has to do with issues of understanding that we have, we are still ignorant about the crucial history of South Africa. We are still ignorant about the true ownership of the land, right? And we are not even talking about uh, violently taking over the land, you know. We, we're not talking about that. We're just talking about, we're talking about a very, very simple thing. Like, there are other indigenous communities throughout the world that have similar kind of issues. Uh, I'm thinking about the Aboriginals in, in Australia. I'm thinking about the Maoris. I'm thinking about the Samis. I'm thinking about the Native Americans, and so on and so on and so on. And one of the ironic things that the South African government did in 2007 was that the, in 2007, there was a United Nations Declaration on the Rights of the Indigenous People. It was a new Bill of Rights that was brought in by the United Nations in 2007. And South Africa was one of those signatories of that U uh, United Nations Declaration. And some of the things that, had, uh, that, that, that is uh, spoken about in the Declaration is this issue of land, you know? Is, that, uh, is this issue of a reparation? And all this time, nothing has been done. So there doesn't seem to be that sort of seriousness on the, uh, on the part of the government. And that is why it is up to um, cultural organizations like 
koi connection, you know, but not even, I, I, I use the word organization, but it's not even an organization, it's just a simple group of musicians, you know, to spread the messages, you know. And even now in, South, in Cape Town, specifically, there are people uh, becoming aware of what it means to, to have communities living, having lived on sea sand for such a long time. And there are, there are community organizations springing up now, after all this time, dealing with these issues about teaching people, you know, conscientizing people how to survive and how to have a productive life in this kind of soil condition. Speaking of healing, uh, from what I know from many talks with you, yeah. uh, there has been a specific moment in your life where, which was like a turning point, and it has a lot to do with a bow as an instrument. Yes. Maybe you can tell the people what... Ah, maybe, yes. maybe, maybe just before, at that time, You worked as a teacher. Yes, I was a teacher. And you worked in a very specific part of, of Cape Town? Yes, District 6. District 6. Yes. And maybe you can yes, I was tell a teacher. the story of that. I was a teacher. I was an art teacher um, for primary school kids in, um, in District 6. It is an old church school, which, which is still around, but it is a traditional church school. And I was the art teacher there. And um, during, a partic um, specifically during the year 1985, um, it was still the apartheid times. And, and was, excuse me to, to interrupt, yeah. but, but was uh, the district, like was it already, uh, was it still existing at that time? No, Or was it? it all, okay. People had already been uh, moved. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking now about the time when I was teaching there was the 1980s. So, so people had been moved already from the mid-60s yeah, onwards. So, so, so from, from what I, I know, the apartheid government just destroyed a whole area, yes. like a legendary area, yes. with, with uh, a lot of artists uh, yes. and, and um, yeah, a, a, a very unique uh, community of people. Yeah. And the apartheid government took the whole area down yes. and the only buildings left were churches and schools. Churches, I yes. Remember that Religious right. buildings, churches, and, and mosques so, and yeah. schools. And so you, you've been a, a teacher at one of those Yes, I was at one of those schools. schools. That's yeah. right. This is when I came up from uh, Port Elizabeth earlier as a, when I came to Cape Town for the first time I found myself lucky enough to be teaching there. Um, But in 1985 was a very important um, year in South Africa, politically speaking. Um, 1985 was the year in which the apartheid government declared a state of emergency. Now, the state of emergency was declared because the, the government had such a lot of problems with the student uprisings since 1976. It had, it had just, it started in 1976, but it just got worse and worse and worse until it reached a kind of a crescendo in 1985 where the government felt that they had to do something. So what they chose to do was, they, they chose to declare a state of emergency, which meant that they closed all education uh, uh, institutions schools, colleges, universities, because the impetus for the struggles in those times came from the students. So they closed everything to do with student life. Even schools, primary and high schools, you know, because schools are just part of the community and they just dealt with things on that grand scale. Um, so I found myself a teacher with a closed school under a state of emergency in the latter part, like this, September of 1985. And what happened to me was that there was no work now. You couldn't go to school. So I, I, dis, I, the, the, I had come up from Port Elizabeth with a lot of questions 
um, personal questions that had to do with all these issues that I've been talking about now, identity and so on and so on, and how to deal with it on a personal level. Um, so coming up with all these questions, which were still bothering me, I took that opportunity of not having any work now during the state of emergency to go and do something about these questions that have been bothering me. I didn't know what to do, but one of the things that I knew I had to do was I had to look at things. I had to look at these questions from a, a historical point of view, right? And so I chose to um, uh, vis take a visit to the Social History Museum in Cape Town, which is a big museum, um, a beautiful museum, um, and I had never been there before. So this was the moment that I could go. And I went there, and that was, that was the moment that was life-changing for me. Because for the, in 1985, I was in my mid-20s, so I had the energy still to do these things that time. Um, I, the, the revelation that I'm talking about is that I discovered all these aspects and facts of history which I'd never known about. It had, I'm talking about now on, a, on, a, on, a, on, on, on an educational level. We'd never been um, taught these things in the, in the education system. A very, very, very simple, I'm, to, I'm not even talking about complex facts and, and, and events and historical um, issues now. I'm talking about very, very simple things, you know? Um, so for the first time, I was exposed to, to these um, historical facts about the history, about the evolution of the social history of South Africa from an anthropological point of view, and it gives you a very, very beautiful understanding of how, of the history of the South African society. If you haven't ever experienced that before, it's a revelation, because you, 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 you can see how things have developed. You can th see how things have evolved. You can see how the, the, the land was taken, you know? You could see how, um, um, how, how South Africa evolved socially. Um, and one of those things, the, the main thing for me that I discovered was the existence of the Khoisan people, uh, um, the indigenous people of South Africa, uh, also known as the Bushmen, right? So for the first time, I began to uh, see these things on a level that made sense to me as a mature person for the first time. And I began to realize that this story, it's almost like a biblical, it's on a biblical level for me, you know. It's for me, this story needs to be told. You know, because even I, if I'm in my mid-twenties and I am ignorant of this, then what? Everybody must be ignorant of this, is the way I thought about it, you know. And especially everybody in my community is, must be ignorant about this. You know, because everybody has had the same sort of education, has gone through the same education system that I went through, right? And so this for me was the most empowering thing. And from that moment onwards, I decided that, um, that I would dedicate my, my, my artistic, my creativity to spreading this kind of knowledge through my work. But not compromising myself from an artistic point of view. You know, I still had a deep understanding of what contemporary means in the art world. You know, I still I have an idea of that. I'm not talking about um, um, uh, uh, doubling back on that. I'm talking about going forward armed now with just a new sense of inspiration and moving forward with that. So one of those things that happened was that I saw in the, in the Social History Museum, there was a section that was dedicated to the musical, the music of the indigenous people, of the Khoisan people. 
Um, and this is like still an old fashioned museum display where they just have objects in glass cases. That's, that was how it was. You couldn't hear these instruments or anything like that. There was just a little bit of text. Um, but seeing the musical instruments for the first time, seeing their shapes, um, just seeing the atmosphere of these musical instruments was very inspirational for me. At that moment, when I left the, the museum, I had been a painter up until that point. And I thought, I'm not going to paint anymore. I thought, no, I'm going, to, I'm going to create. Now, I wasn't thinking of music in terms of making music. I was thinking artistically. I was, uh, in terms of medium, I was thinking, whoa, these instruments are so beautiful. And I'm so inspired by them. I think I'm going to create sculptural works, three-dimensional works that's inspired by, by, by the, the atmosphere of these kinds of um, uh, uh, instruments, you know? It was only a visual encounter. It was it just was a visual. Not, you didn't hear Absolutely the sounds not. of those instruments. Not at all. And, yeah. Not at all. It was the furthest thing from my mind, yeah. you know. Um, so I went home with that kind of feeling and that thought and that inspiration. And of course, I just had to use my intuition because all you had was a vision, and you had to go and like you know uh, build something similar. And it was in the building of these sculptures that I discovered the sound that these instruments made. Um, because the instruments I'm talking about were the very, very, very simple bow and arrow did, did you Did you compare the sound of the instruments that you built with the ones you saw in a museum? Maybe they sounded very different. I'm sure they sounded very different. This for me is the magic, actually, because I've, I've I, for a very, very, very long time afterwards, I never, ever heard those instruments. I never heard um, audio examples of those instruments. I simply had the sound of what I had discovered at home. But even what I had discovered at home was, was, was perfect in itself. You know, the music that it had made was perfect in itself. And I felt that I... I, I didn't need to become a, a scientist now to be correct about things. I had discovered a beauty of my own, of my own making. And I could, I could, I could very much easily live with that for the rest of my life. It was so beautiful, you know? And so this is how music, this is how I discovered music in my life. And I have to, I have to give all the praise to that moment in, 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 in the museum because it was from the Khoisan um, um, display in the museum. So for me, it was a gift from my ancestors, right? But it was like a, uh, okay, it was a gift from my ancestors and I had to, I had, I had to do it justice. I had to do it justice by being true to it in a weird way, you know. Um, I know I'm talking, I'm being very romantic now in the way I'm talking, but really this, this was how personal I felt about that, that moment of discovery. Um, and so I, I, I had a, a different sense of appreciation, right, for the indigenous culture. So much so that I wanted to share this with my community, in my community. And this is how I moved forward from that moment. Um, it also, in a very, very weird way, gave me an understanding of all musics throughout the world, you know? Because I'd been a very typical young man. I'd, I'd come up uh, listening to rock music and jazz music and pop music, you know what I mean? I had a sense, uh, and, and, and you have a sense of what musical instruments sound like in this Western sense, right? But then the gift for me that I learned from the indigenous instruments was I had an understanding of how the Western instruments worked. 
because I realized that the source of Western instruments comes from this well of knowledge. And I realized that this, a simple bow and arrow, that simple object, that the, the, the main discovery or the main, the main factor about that instrument that makes it so amazing is this discovery of tension. You, you begin to realize that all music depends on tension to create vibration, right? Um, a piano needs to have tensioned strings in order to make a beautiful music. A guitar needed to have tensioned strings. A violin needed to have tensioned strings, you know? And it's this understanding of tension for me that was so beautiful. Was it, was it difficult uh, at that time to listen to any types of indig indigenous uh, music in, in South Africa? I'm asking that question because I've been to Kenya a lot and uh, I did a lot of um, sound recordings mm -hmm. um, in very rural parts of the right. country, mostly but predominantly next to right. the border to Uganda. Right. And we brought some of those recordings to, to a radio station in Nairobi. Right. right. And so when we played that music, uh, the guy at the radio station said, we haven't listened to that type of music for 20 years. Right. So. right. And so I think it is, um, to a degree, it seems to be more or easier to listen to traditional music, uh, for example, from Kenya in, in Europe right. than, than, in, than in Kenya. It's, so. the same. It's, the same. it's the same with us, really, really it is. I, because... For many, many, many years after that, I, ne I was never, I never had the opportunity to be exposed to recordings of, um, of this kind of uh, nature, you know. But there are one or two examples along the way where, say, in a film, or a documentary on the TV, I might come across, whoa, listen to that, I know what that is. I know, that's, that's, the, that's, that's, the, that's the old, ancient music from here where we are, you know? Um, this is how I began to be exposed to these things, but never on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on another level than that. There are no libraries that one could go to. So you would, you would, you would have to, to go to, to see the musicians? You, you, yes. Yes, you had to travel to the musicians yes. that they yes. would play the music to exactly. you. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And Gath, would you like to explain about, maybe a little bit about the techniques you discovered with the bow? Because I know that this bow, you can see there, this is the one from, from 1985. Yeah. Yes, that one. And I noticed this one it has the calabash. Yes. And the first one in the row there doesn't have a calabash. So maybe you can explain a little bit about the different techniques. Okay, yeah. Well, um, as, I, as I say, um, um, the, te the techniques, the I had, to, I had to create the techniques myself. I had to, I had to find out for myself, you know? Um, and I think I am, a little bit, I'm, I am a little bit of a crafty person, you know? At school, I, I, the only subject that I, I was really good at was woodwork, you know? S simply because it was, you could you work with your hands, you know? Um, so I am a little bit of crafty. Uh, in that in that sense, but um, yeah, the techniques are oh, the techniques are. Oh, I don't even know how to. One of the few things that came to my mind when um, I was in Kenya for the first of a time to record musicians that 
Each musician is also the builder of the instruments. There's yes. no shop where right. you can buy those instruments. <laughs> right. Because we had a recording session and there was one of a flute player. <laughs> so he went to the bush and came yeah. back with a few branches yeah. of wood and then he started carving the wood and yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, by the end of the day the flute was finished. That's okay. right. Yeah, That's they right. all. That's right. Yeah. Uh, something I, that you don't consider when, yeah. you, when you come from the center of Europe. Yeah. So. I, 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 I very quickly realized that that, to, that was my situation. I had to be like that, you know, um, but not out of any other, not out of choice or any kind of grand scheme or anything. It was just practical, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and. But the other thing that these instruments, the first instruments that I made did to me is it gave me an understanding of the principles of music, if I can put it like that. Uh, the principles of making sound, the principles of how sound is produced. Uh, as I said, this principle of tension is very interesting for me. It's very interesting for me because tension creates vibration and vibration is the source of, the, of music, of the sound. Um, so it is simply with a little bit of intuition on my part it is, and, and, and imagination. It's simply playing around with this medium, you know, playing around with how to create tension, how to, how to, how to this, how to that. And, and so after 1985, for about three or four years after that, I had a range of instruments at, at home, at my disposal. Um, instruments that were really weird to look at. I mean, the, they, they, they weren't like, 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 like beautiful instruments. Like they, they, they're all like works in progress, you know, for me. But for me, they are more like artworks than instruments. And this is for me, my life. I don't, I don't really like to consider myself as a musician. I don't really like to go there because I understand what these things mean, you know. Um, for me, I am very interested in the intersection between visual art and music. Um, this is a very interesting space to, to, to inhabit. Um, and this is where I like to be, you know. Um, it's a bit like the saying of Joseph Beuys, when you're seriously interested in music, you should not be able to play the piano. <laughs> It's a bit like that. It's, it's, it's much more exciting. It's much more interesting, um, I find, you know. So, yeah, danke, Herr Boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, the, 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 ins the other interesting thing for me about, especially the bow, is that it's just one, just one string, you know. And when you are personally involved with it, you realize that there are so many different sounds. And over the years, I've learned words like overtones and so on, which I never knew in the beginning. But there are so many possible sounds that you can create out of one single string. It's amazing, you know? And these are the kinds of things that, keeps, that kept me moving forward, moving forward. Also, I think, if I may use the term, uh, a spiritual mm -hmm. thing. It's not so your rediscovery of the bow is, for one, your personal pleasure. Yeah. And but it's also political. It's also political in, in, in the sense yeah. you described. Yeah. And but it's also a spiritual thing. Yes, it's all those things. And uh, yes, and uh, for the opening. Three weeks ago, you um, you uh, you did a poem. Yes. Can I don't know if you have it in your mind, but maybe you can explain about that that poem because it's a it's a very old poem, I guess. Yeah, it's a very old poem. Yeah. And it's, and and it's, it's called it's called uh, the song of the broken string, and I I, I I'm not going to be able to do it do it justice right now because it's not completely in my head but the title of it says a lot it says it all it's, it's the song of the broken string so from a metaphorical point of view 
um, the poem talks about having been cut off from one's origins. The song of the broken string. It talks of a bow string being broken. And so if it is broken, it has lost its function. It has lost its character. It has lost its identity. And this is an old poem that comes from hundreds of years back. And it was um, um, related to uh, one of those early European um, anthrop anth anthropologists that were doing studies in these fields. And that's where we get this poem. Huh? That is how it has survived all this time. Um, yes, that's right. Um, but um, talking about the spiritual nature and, 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 and the healing aspect and, and the political and so on, for me, this is what these instruments do also. Not just here performing in, in a European context, but back home, you know? Because people back home, you may not be aware of it, but people back home don't know about these instruments. So that is another interesting aspect of working in the Koi Connection. Or even when I do this work on my own, you know? When I play the bow in public at home, um, Having the bow, having the bow, holding the bow is like wearing my culture, you know? I am, I am in my culture now. And this, if this is what people see, you know, um, I know I don't, have to say a, I don't have to say a word, you know? They, they, they will know what this is all about, you know? Because this is what happened to me as a young man. Nobody, nobody needed to tell me anything. I, would, I could just recognize what these forms and shapes represent. So that is what I consider when I play the bow in South Africa. I consider it almost like my uniform that I'm wearing, you know. Um, I consider it wearing my culture, you know. Um, I consider it my duty, almost. Um, to show these things, you know, as much as I can. So in that sense, it has a political effect. And um, it's, it is very effective. There are many, many stories I can tell you over the years about how people have reacted and responded when hearing these, thing, uh, these instruments being played for the first time grown men with tears coming down their eyes, you know, um, those kinds of stories, right? Very, very emotional. And um, from all those years back in South Africa to now, there has been a major, major shift in the consciousness of what we call the colored people now. People are slowly, slowly coming around to understanding on a deeper political level what we have been speaking about for all these years, right? But it was never on, on the tongue of the people, but it is now on the tongue of the people. People now, people now know this word Khoisan, what it means. They own it, right? It, gives them power, right? They understand now, right? Because they've been suffering too long, right? This, is, uh, uh, this has been the effect of, 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 of apartheid, actually. But people, you can't really, you can't really tell a person what, what, how apartheid af has affected you, you know? That in itself is a spiritual thing. You can't... Um, um, illness... Disease is a spiritual thing, you know, on this kind of level I'm talking about, right? Because this is, this is like a cultural, cultural pain, right? It's, it's on a deep level. You can't put words to it, you know? Um, but gradually, you will find ordinary, ordinary people in South Africa in the colored community now 
beginning to think twice about using that word colored. And all of you should understand that, you know, this is for, for, for everybody, this is for everybody. The word colored in South Africa is on the same level as, say, nigger in America, you know, it's on the very, very same level, you know. And, and this is what the politicians in our country still don't understand, right? But as I said, this is the next frontier of struggle in South Africa. It, you will not hear about it yet because it's not, it's not out there yet, you know. It's still, it's still being kept um, under the carpets, you know, because the politicians don't want people to know that there's still a problem in South Africa. And um, to, uh, I don't know how long we still got to go, but I, I'd like to give you an idea. I'd like to give you an idea. During the apartheid times, if there was anything administrative that you had to do, right? It is always about filling in boxes, filling in forms that had like words like colored or blood on it, right? Not even a long ago, I did a little job for the University of Cape Town in this year. And when they paid me, I had to fill in a form where it, at the end it wanted to know which racial group do you belong to. And this is what I mean. It is meant for government statistics for the affirmative action thing that they want to do, right? So now, that's what I'm saying. How different is, how different is it now spiritually? What does it do to a person that must still do that in 2022, who's 60 odd years old, right? What spiritually, what, what trauma is that person going through? Don't don't the politicians understand? They have no understanding of the grassroots feelings of their own citizens. And this is what I'm talking about. You know, when I talk about a new horizon of struggle in South Africa. If they don't take notice too quickly, it's going to spill over. Because that's what history teaches us, you know. I would have had another few questions to you. <laughs> but I think we're slowly running out of time. Uh, 7.30. 7.30 already? Yes. Okay, so uh, if you have questions for me, please, very short questions. Uh, um, one question. What was your motivation to go to um, to Namibia. So I, as far as I know, you didn't travel there as a traveling musician. You went there in a, not by yourself, but uh, what was your motivation to go there and what did you want to, to discover there? Was it like a research on German colonial history or was it about the music or? Yeah, it was specifically, it was a research trip uh, with, uh, for example, with Ruth and, and with Nick Duvich uh, from the group uh, 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 Showcase Pete Lemo, who was part of the uh, House of Falling Bones project and who will pe perform with us on Thursday here. Um, and we went on a trip with, uh, with Jethro and Glenn from Core Connection. And we tried to... Um, How did you meet each other in beforehand? You knew each other and then you yeah, a friend, a, f a friend of me and Ruth, uh, uh, who was often in, in, uh, in Cape Town, brought, okay. went to a Core Connection concert, I think in maybe around uh, 2014, 15 or so. And, and she came back and said, hey, I, I listened to a great band and uh, it's called Core Connection. And luckily enough, the one like official record Core Connection did is for some reason on iTunes. 
Really? <laughs> it is, yes. You should ask. <laughs> so there are some, there's maybe some money to get from, from iTunes. And uh, uh, I listened to, to the record and I immediately f fell in love with the music and, uh, uh, because it was such a special, unique music. At the same time, it, it reminded me very much, um, I was thinking very much about, for example, Art Ensemble of Chicago, like the, let's say, second generation um, uh, black American uh, free jazz groups. And uh, ever since I had had the group in mind, and, and when, um, when we had the idea to do this theater piece, then I discovered this connection of Khoisan people and the Nama in, um, in Namibia. And so we evolved, uh, we, 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 we uh, had this concept of visiting Namibia from two different countries and see if we can find some traces of this, of, of the uh, history. And for me, I think, what I discovered more than those folk tales or those traces of German history was for me personally more like I discovered like my own consciousness, like being away from Germany in this very different context, I started to think about my own ways of thinking and f even feeling. How do I uh, situate myself in, in, in the world? How, how do I perceive uh, landscape, for example? And so from that on, that was a, for me personally a long process to uh, get aware also about my privileges as a, as a uh, white, male, European, but also about my very personal uh, ways of feeling and looking uh, on things, on, on the world, uh, on, on my surroundings. And um, which is also a bit part of this exhibition. For me, it is like the, like a second step or so. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, I think it's in many ways more personal this, uh, uh, this exhibition than the House of Falling Bones project. Are, you, are there any ideas to bring this exhibition uh, to, to, South, to South Africa or to Namibia? I, I would love to, but uh, uh, it's, yeah, let's see if it's, it's a very expensive thing to bring all the stuff. You know, that was the same, the same with House of Falling Bones. Uh, uh, it's a bit of fabric and yeah, it's this would, some this would maybe work. Can't yeah. be that expensive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe someday. But maybe we should do a new exhibition <laughs> or record or something else. Um, shall we have a break? And yeah, very much. Maybe maybe um, we can we can quickly open to the to the audience if you have any questions for 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 Garth. Otherwise, we, we do a little break and then uh, we just improvise a little bit of music. Thank you. 